Uh, I'm sorry, I cannot speak in Spanish. My Spanish is not that good, but I could follow some of the uh, introductory remarks, and I'm really excited to see uh, Poderi Progreso now translated into Spanish and available to uh, Spanish readers in Spain and all around the world. So uh, it is uh, uh, it it is a synthesis and. Uh, advancement of my own ideas in this area on which I have been working for, you know, more than a decade. And uh, I now want to share a brief presentation to uh, talk about some aspects of the book and uh, the issues that the book is trying to cover. So let me share my screen. Part of economists' approach to new technology is that there are powerful market forces that will create a tendency for society more broadly to benefit from them. Market competition, especially in the mar labor market where wages are going to increase if firms become more productive. This is central because most of us in modern society make our living from the labor market, from wage income, from salaries. And if this link from new technologies to labor market benefits for the population were broken, we would not be so sanguine about the implications of technology. Today, we are at the cusp of transformative changes in digital technology and especially artificial intelligence. And it is high time to revisit these ideas. And the first one, this idea that there is a powerful productivity bandwagon from which workers benefit as new technologies are introduced actually is more subject to criticism than generally presumed. So the chain of reasoning, technology improves, productivity rises, workers also benefit, is predicated in a number of crucial assumptions, which are sometimes good approximations to what goes on in reality and sometimes not. One is that once productivity increases, there are reasons for the demand for workers from firms to rise. And the second is that once that happens and firms are seeking to hire more labor, then what goes on in the market economy ensures that wages go up. Neither of these two things are unconditionally true, meaning that they depend on historical institutions and choices about the direction of technology. Let me start with the latter and talk about two transformative technologies of the last 1,000 years. The first one on the left here is medieval breakthrough in production, the introduction of windmills that, introduced, that m multiplied productivity by uh, more than tenfold in a number of key tasks. And the, right, well, the one on the right is Eli Whitney's cotton gin, which enabled cotton production in the U.S. South and made the U.S. South from an economic backwater into the heart of the growing cotton economy, the largest cotton exporter in the world in the 19th century. In both of these cases, we see that the productivity bandwagon is nowhere to be seen. In the medieval case, all of the benefits from windmills were captured by a small elite, uh, the aristocracy and the clergy that owned the land and controlled who could uh, use which types of mills and actually monitored all sorts of pr competitive activities as well, while a large fraction of the population was locked in a servile relationship in the feudal system. On the right, uh, of course, the workers who produced cotton were the black and slave people in the United States, in the U.S. South, and they saw ne no benefit from the cotton gin. In fact, all the evidence we have suggests that their conditions significantly worsened because they were moved to the deep south where life expectancy was shorter, uh, working days were longer, and their real incomes probably declined. In both cases, the reason why this is the case is quite simple to see. We were very far from the competition, and in particular, workers had no power. 
They had no organizational power because in the medieval economy or in, in, in the slavery system of the U.S. South, all power was with the uh, with the elite and nothing similar to competitive processes were working in the labor market at the time. So when this first wheel of the productivity bandwagon and institutional power of labor doesn't work, we're not going to get anything approaching the type of worker benefits that simple economic analysis and policymakers' hopes really imply. Now, the Industrial Revolution, which is where the beginning of our current prosperity started, is a more complex phenomenon because this was a process in which a series of technological changes happened and some uh, of them were embedded in an institutional setting which was very different from slavery or the servile system. But when we look at it, at least for the first 100 years, the picture is much more complicated than the rosy one that most people today uh, recount when they say, look, workers benefited from industrial technology, and we also expect them to benefit from uh, uh, artificial intelligence. There were some aspects of it similar to what we saw in the cotton gin, that employers had too much power, especially when they could use new technologies for monitoring purposes and structured the employment relations in a very unequal way in modern factories. But a very important part of it was also how the factory system was used. And this brings the heart of, uh, the, uh, of my argument here, which is that it makes a big difference whether you use technologies in ways that are pro-worker, meaning help workers uh, become more productive, increase tasks and more complex tasks that they can perform, versus just displacing workers via automation. Automation is always uh, one of the options open to employers and has been with us for at least since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And what we see at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution is what happens when the only focus of new technology is automation. And what happened is that first in spinning and then weaving and then in other parts of the textile and non-textile industries, new machinery displaced workers. As a result of this, firms started making more money because they could substitute cheaper machines for human labor. But many of the workers were not part of the beneficiaries of that technological progress. Part of it was because workers became more dispensable. Uh, weavers, for example, which were very well-paid uh, skilled laborers, saw their incomes fall by more than 30% as they were displaced from, uh, 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 from the production process with mechanized looms. And the working conditions for the more unskilled laborers that were substituted for the weavers were much worse. Many of them were women and children, and even uh, in broader circumstances, the uh, conditions of the factory were hugely uh, harsh. Working conditions worsened, wages were low and did not increase, and this was all embedded in a broader system in which employers and capital was enabled to monitor workers tightly as symbolized by something that is part of our current culture but wasn't actually implemented at the time, which is Jeremy uh, uh, Bentham's Panopticon, uh, which he designed in 1791, building on what actually his brother implemented uh, earlier on in, in a St. Petersburg naval factory. And also the working conditions were not the only thing that were horrible. Living conditions worsened significantly with uh, uncontrolled pandemics, epidemics, and highly polluted cities in which life expectancy may have fallen as low as to 30, per 30 years at birth in some parts of England. So... This sort of indicates the very harsh conditions in which labor found itself, even though new machinery was completely revolutionizing the production process and, of course, laying the foundations of our current uh, comfort and improvements. How did this all change? I think that's a very critical part of the story, which I'm going to come back to in a second, because... Again, my argument is not going to be that artificial intelligence and digital technologies are something that are going to condemn us to poverty, unemployment, or inequality, but they provide opportunities as well as challenges, and we have to be clear-eyed in order to understand how we can make this work, and there are going to be no automatic productivity bandwagons or other 
processes that are going to uh, guarantee that everybody becomes the beneficiaries. So uh, before I go to all of these uh, issues, I want to first talk about one other uh, big picture point, which is that this well, the, the issues that I have mentioned so far and that are the first half of the book are not of just historical interest. The reason why Simon and I make them the centerpiece of the first half of the book in Power and Progress is because modern times aren't all that different. Of course, today we have no slavery, no serfdom in the industrialized world, but we have some tensions in the labor market that are pretty remarkable and pretty extreme in the way that they are exhibiting themselves, especially in the United States. But the phenomena that I'm talking about is more broad than just the US. And I'll be happy to talk about uh, the European and more broader Asian implications of, uh, of this industrialization. But here I start by showing what's happened in the US labor market to earnings. And I distinguish 10 demographic groups on the left men, on the right women. And also the color coding here distinguishes five education groups all the way up from workers with postgraduate degrees uh, in dark blue, workers who have a college degree, university education, but no postgraduate degree in light blue, and all the way down to people with two-year degrees, just a high school degree in green, and less than a high school degree in orange. In the 1960s, what you see is a pattern of shared prosperity, whereby different uh, demographic groups are exhibiting very similar behavior of their real incomes and real wages, uh, witnessed by the fact that all five of these curves are on top of each other. Some of them, in fact, you don't even see because they are so tightly packed together. In fact, this is not everybody being miserable together. It's a period of very rapid economic improvements for all of these demographic groups. Real wages are growing about 2.5% a year in real terms, inflation-adjusted terms. And if you go to the 1950s, the pattern is similar, even better for low-skilled workers. But then in the late 1970s uh, and around 1980, you see a sea change. With the wages of postgraduate workers continues to increase, as you can see with the dark blue lines, but the wages of the rest of the population stagnates or in fact, becomes negative. For men with less than a college degree, you can see on the left, real incomes are falling quite sharply in the 1980s and 1990s, and you see similar pattern for women as well. This is not a, just a U.S. phenomenon. The extent to which inequality explodes is very extreme in the United States, and you have no minimum wage or weak minimum wages, very little union bargaining after the 1980s, and social norms are uh, not very much restricting inequality increases. So you see this big the, the drop in the real incomes of workers at the bottom. But the, the, the more important two patterns that I have emphasized, which is inequality became, becoming unshared so that people with low education are no longer benefiting and inequality increasing are quite common within the industrialized world. And so here I'm showing OECD data for a number of countries, and you see the same pattern happening in country after country, with a few exceptions. U.S. is exceptional in the extent of inequality and how large the increase in inequality is, for example, as measured by the Gini coefficient, but there are similar patterns for other countries as well. So to understand this epoch, we need to go back and ask ourselves, what was it that enables the more shared prosperity of the 1950s and 60s. And in fact, how did the first phase of the Industrial Revolution that uh, was so immiserizing for the working classes come to an end? And why is it that after, say, around 1850s, we see wage increases for workers in the United Kingdom and then in the United States, as well as just increases in profits? And there are two key wheels of this type of bandwagon, and they are related to the ideas that I've talked about already. First, 
you need that the technological changes don't just automate, but they also create new jobs, new tasks, new capabilities for workers. This is, for instance, here illustrated by the U.S. auto industry, although I could have provided illustrations from 19th century, second half of the 19th century British industries as well. But the auto industry is quite telling because starting in the first decade of uh the 20th century, led by Henry Ford and other uh, uh, innovators, the auto industry was at the forefront of electrification and automation, new machinery that started creating cheaper ways of producing certain tasks. But it was also at the forefront of introducing new tasks for workers. So what you see on the, the assembly line here on the picture on the top is that, you know, uh, even though there is something that looks like a primitive version of the assembly line and new machinery that's actually quite remarkable by the standards of what was going on in the industry earlier in the 20th century, earlier at the, uh, at the end of the 19th century, you also have workers playing a key role. They're performing new technical tasks. Uh, their skilled work is, crafts work is quite necessary. And then this is all supported by design work, innovation work, back office functions that are completely new. As a result of it, uh, even though the auto industry was becoming more and more capital intensive, it was also employing more and more workers, increasing its employment level by about tenfold from the beginning of the 20th century to around the time of the Second World War. But it wasn't only new technologies that were revolutionary. Organizational changes were revolutionary as well. The uh, auto industry was also at the forefront of labor organization, both in Ford factories, General Motor factories, and other factories. And here I'm showing a picture from the sit-down strike of the United Auto Workers in 1937, which was one of the landmark victories for the labor movement in ensuring better working conditions and higher wages. This looks very different from the picture that we have today. And if you look at the pattern of production in a car factory today, it looks like this, where you have a more advanced assembly line and much, much more advanced machinery here, for example, uh, represented by the robot arms. But more jarring, in my opinion, is the fact that there are no equivalents of the skilled workers doing more complex tasks. There's only one worker in this picture, and he's not involved in the production process at all. So the there has been a lot of focus on automation, but not enough on creating new tasks. And as I mentioned, if you just automate and do not create new tasks, you're not going to generate the labor demand. And at the same time, we, have, we are seeing that this automation focus has been a very important part of the inequality changes. And here I'm illustrating that with a figure from my work with Pascual Restrepo, where I am looking at now more detailed demographic groups, not just by gender and education. The same pattern with education, same colors are here as well. Uh, we, we have the uh, I actually, the color scheme has changed. Sorry about that. Uh, we have the workers with postgraduate degrees here. These are those with college degrees, and these are uh, high school education and low education, uh, uh, high school dropout men. And I'm looking at the changes in hourly wages now from 1980 to today, or 2016-17, and you see the the zero line here. So this indicates that the real wages of all of these demographic groups, about half of the demographic groups have actually declined. And these demographic groups are distinguished by uh, ethnicity and uh, age in addition to education and gender. But the more important part of this picture is that uh, I include here on the horizontal axis the measure that Pascual Restrepo and I have created for the extent of automation of the tasks that a demographic group has experienced. So 15% here, for example, means that 15% of the tasks that that demographic group used to perform, for example, workers with two-year colleges that are young and men, those have been automated since by robots, other uh, factory equipment, and software systems in offices. And what you see here is a very strong negative relationship uh, illustrating what I claimed in the previous uh, slide, that there is a tight relationship between automation and the changes in the wage structure. But it's not just automation. Around the same time, also, the fundamental tenets of how production is organized and how the gains are distributed started changing. And in the U.S. context, uh, two important uh 
pillars of this, which have then influ influenced the rest of the uh, industrialized world is changes in the values and priorities of corporations, which here I represent by the ideas of the famous Chicago economist Milton Friedman, who famously argued that the social responsibility of business is to increase its profits. In particular, sharing those gains with workers was something that managers shouldn't do and trying to find ways of cutting costs, for example, by slowing down wage growth or automating work were very much what uh, the responsibility of uh, managers was, according to Milton Friedman's arguments. And this encouraged a change in the organizational form where there was much less uh, effort to share the gains with other stakeholders and shareholders, much greater focus on automation and cost cutting. And at the same time, the uh, key organizations that resisted that type of behavior, for example, the labor movement, which I emphasize as a integral part of the greater sharing earlier on became much weaker. This was part of a secular change, but also, especially after Ronald Reagan was elected, he took a very stark anti-union attitude. So this is, for example, the professional air traffic controllers strike uh, in 1981, 82, and, uh, which ended by Ronald Reagan firing all the striking workers. Now, all of these issues have been with us for more than four decades, and that's why I think uh, looking at what happens in the 1980s, 90s, and early 2000s is central. But they are all also becoming much more important today because we are at the cusp of major changes in AI. And I would say this is the right time to worry because the new advances in AI, especially generative technologies, are indeed creating new ways of increasing productivity. But those changes they are not going to naturally translate into shared prosperity. It will depend on institutions and the direction of change. And here, in fact, what makes the generative uh, technology, generative AI technology so interesting is that they create a lot of different opportunities. So a number of studies show that it is possible to use these generative AI technologies in ways that increase worker productivity in uh, software uh, preparation programming, in writing tasks, in customer service. And the way to do this, I have argued for the last 10 years, is view generative AI as a way of providing better information to workers. Uh, an irony of our current age is that we have abundant information, for example, on the internet, but useful information is scarce because when you need it, you cannot get it from this vast sea of information. Generative AI should be viewed as a technology that can enable that kind of information to be obtained in real time and provided to productive workers. We meet a craft workers such as electricians, manual workers on the factory floor, and especially knowledge workers in offices. And in all of these cases, if you can do that, you are going to help especially workers with middle levels of expertise, meaning workers who have some knowledge of their field, for example, electricians, but they're not the very best electrician. And in fact, were, uh, evidence from Noy and Zhang and Brynja Lufsen et al. exactly show this pattern that if you use generative AI in the correct way, it's the workers with middle levels or low levels of expertise who are specializing in those tasks that can benefit because it makes up for their uh, shortcomings in terms of information. But here, it really turns in the direction of technology, how we're going to use this technology. And my uh, emphasis in the book is that this is going to depend on very important choices institutional as well as related to the vision or ideology of the powerful actors, uh, regulators, but especially tech entrepreneurs, tech companies, and policymakers in, the, in Europe, where uh, there are different currents than in the United States. And in fact, if you look at the history of AI, going back to the early days, you see two very different visions that have been uh, uh, ebbing and flowing from time to time. One of them, which uh, I associate with this brilliant mathematician, Alan Turing, and was formative in the early stages of the AI revolution, for example, the Dartmouth project that's, that christened the field in 1956, is that what matters is machine intelligence. Computers should become autonomously intelligent, and that was related to Alan Turing's philosophical writings, mathematical writings, as well as his imitation game, which many of you would have seen from the Hollywood movie on the Enigma machine and Alan Turing. 
this vision, unfortunately, I think is flawed, and and its and its implications are actually quite dire because it inexorably leads to a bias towards automation and towards centralization of information, as I'm going to argue in a second as well. But there is a better vision for AI, which is associated with uh, several other brilliant uh, scientists and thinkers. For example, MIT's Norbert Wiener, who started writing more or less around the same time as Alan Turing, which emphasizes a very different aspect. And Simon Johnson and I call this machine usefulness rather than machine intelligence. What, I, what we mean by that is that these people understood that computers' real uh, potential came in if they could be useful to humans. And what I highlighted just a second ago, and it's the center of the book, which is that we can use AI to provide information, to pro make workers better, more productive, more tasks for workers, is very much in line with this vision. Now, when this vision was more powerful, it actually led to some uh, really landmark innovations, including the computer mouse, hypertext, uh, JCR lick lighters, uh, pioneering of uh, the better, better parts of the internet early on in the 1970s and the 1980s. And it's actually many of these people thought this as a way of achieving human machine symbiosis, meaning that machines make humans more productive because they provide them with better information and better decision making capabilities. Unfortunately, that's not what we are in right now. So when you are trying to excessively automate work, whatever it actually does to workers and whatever it does to the organizations, we are very much being slavishly following the machine intelligence agenda. Now, the problem is that in many instances, machine intelligence doesn't even yield the productivity increases that it promises. Why not? Because Humans are actually not all that bad in the tasks that they do. So if you emphasize machine intelligence rather than helping humans become decision makers, you're actually sidelining humans when they have useful skills, useful contextual expertise, and useful accumulated knowledge that will help the production process. And you're going to have lots of breakdowns in the production chain. And today, uh, there are so many examples of automation gone wrong in the U.S. economy, especially in offices, that we, we wouldn't know where to start. And this is what Pascual Restrepo and I have called so-so automation. You get limited productivity benefits if humans are good and machines are not as good as sometimes presumed, but you still get all of the inequality and the displacement effects because you're rushing into automation. Now, it doesn't end there. And in my mind, the biggest threat of AI is not just impoverishment of the working class and inequality, those are very important, but another corollary of the machine intelligence obsession that we see today, especially with our uh, artificial general intelligence and that sort of ideas that have become so commonplace, especially with uh, large language models, centralization of information. The view that machines can be smart and humans are not going to be as smart as machines has a natural corollary. Information should be taken from humans so that machines can be in control or algorithms can be in control or people who control the algorithms can be in control. This exhibits itself in different ways, but actually I think there are more similarities between these two pictures than first meets the eye. The bottom one is the Chinese social credit system, which under the tutelage of the Chinese Communist Party, every aspect of an individual's life, including their social media activity, their comments on the internet, or even their comments at work are going to be curated so that they can be decided whether they're a good citizen and they can be allowed to get housing or even allowed to take trains. And on top, you have large uh, tech companies, in this instance, Facebook, engage in content moderation because they control all the information. So they have to decide what you see and what you don't. And what you are witnessing here is an extreme degree of centralization of information exhibiting itself in very different formats. So in the last three minutes, I want to talk about very briefly about if this is the situation, how can we ensure that we head towards shared prosperity and a more democratic future? And the first step is that we need to change the narrative away uh, uh, away from the desirability of top-down schemes. So if machine usefulness rather than machine intelligence is going to be the future, then we need that humans are much more at the driving seat. And by humans, I don't mean just one or two humans, but the broader collective intelligence and collective decision-making capacity. So democratic control over institutions, but also democratic say over the direction of technology. So what's wrong with this picture? This picture 
uh, exacerbates the same biases that we see in the tech industry in the United States, where it's the powerful individuals who decide what the future of technology should be, but they are actually deciding what the future of society should be and who should have power and who shouldn't. The alternative is to build institutions, and institutions come from countervailing powers. Today's regulations in the United States, which then spread to the rest of the industrialized world that protect consumers, would not be possible without civil society organization, for example, for consumer protection. And bottom-up organization from civil society will have to play an equally important role. Implementing appropriate regulations, taxes, antitrust, uh, and all of these things are also going to be helped if labor has a say. And today we are seeing a reawakening in the labor movement in the United States. It's very much in its infancy, but it is at least giving some hope that it's going to be another pillar of this countervailing powers that I'm talking about. Uh, the most important idea of the book, and it's really the central idea of the book, is that all of this is not just a question of what we do are with existing technologies, but it's about redirecting technological change. So we need a completely different agenda for technology to enhance human capabilities. By the way, again, this wasn't uh, this isn't something that Simon and I came up with. It was part of the agenda of people like Norbert Wiener and Douglas Engelbart that I pointed out. And it was also very much the hope of the early computer innovators in the 1970s as well. People like Ted Nelson, who thought that personal computers would be revolutionary because it would empower people. Computer power to the people was the uh, slogan that he used to use in many places. And, uh, and, and translated into the framework that I'm presenting, what he was talking about was about decentralization information, new tasks, and greater human agency. And all of these things are possible. One skeptical question and I uh, is that the government has no capability to redirect technological change, especially when it comes to complex technologies such as artificial intelligence or digital technology. And I, I will end with this graph, which shows that at least in, uh, in one important other arena, a very small amount of government intervention has led to a major redirection of technological change in the energy sector. Uh, you see here how expensive uh, renewable energy was in 2000. Solar and photovoltaic, solar photovoltaic or concentration technologies were not even feasible. Offshore wind and onshore wind was were highly expensive relative to fossil fuels. But with some regulation, some civil society action, taxes and uh, uh, subsidies to renewable energy from Europe and the United States. There has been a tremendous uh, revolution in new patents and new innovations in renewables. And as a result today in electricity generation, all types of renewables are more uh, cost competitive, in fact, cheaper than fossil fuels. And we, if we go back in history, we see other examples of government intervention having similar major effects on the redirection of technology. And I think there is no reason to imagine that the same cannot be done for digital technologies and AI, which are going to be so important for shared prosperity, for inequality, and for democracy in the future. Thank you. Thank you.